Hello, everybody. This is Javier Gonzalez. You're listening to a special edition of Your Money Matters with Doug Lynham, the author of From Monk to Money Manager. And today, as we teased a little bit last week, uh, Doug, we have a, an awesome a special guest with us, Father Richard Rohr, an accomplished author, an incredible uh, faith leader, uh, an all-around friend to New Mexico and many people from from afar. Father Richard, thank you so much for being with us. I'm honored. Thank you. Well, you know, I have spent the last several weeks with Doug uh, going over his book, From Monk to Money Manager. And it's been an incredible journey, not only for me, uh, trying to understand how I could do everything from conquering my money monsters to even understanding some of the biblical themes that have driven us into some of the behavior that we thought we I needed to do to, to support Scripture, and I've learned that I got it wrong, and I've been able to, to learn from Doug. And we've been able to hear from a number of listeners who not only have enjoyed the show, but it's been very transformative to them to Ooh, understand that there is uh, there's a basic way to get started in dealing with your money management, but there's also a faith component uh, to that as well. And so I know you being an accomplished author, uh, certainly you've had your share of of. Uh, people that have offered input on your book. So right off the bat, I wanted to know if you'd be willing to offer some input on Doug's book before we let him even speak. You know, I obviously was inclined to trust it because I trust him. But I was surprised how much I did like it (laughs) uh, when I finally got to reading it. I, I get sent two to six books a day. Oh, my goodness. So they just create stacks in my office and in in my house. But um, I I did sit down and start reading, and I loved it. And I didn't expect to because uh, I don't know why. Well, you know, the archetype of attitudes toward money, Mm -hmm. I'm the deer caught in the headlights person. Uh And now that was easy for me to be, because I'm a Franciscan, we take a vow of poverty, so we just never have to think or worry about money. You know, anything we earn, uh, the royalties from my books and tapes, so it goes to the order, mm-hmm. which was, was intended to free you from that fascination with money because it didn't make a bit of difference, mm-hmm. you know. But the downside of it was that our our early childhood training uh, from our family, uh, from the culture we lived in, uh, pretty much still dominated in how we thought about money. And I was raised in Kansas, German farmer parents uh, who were not only raised during the Depression, but during the dust storm. Mm. Or my dad had to move off the farm to get a job on the railroad, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, in fact, moved to Topeka. And um, their philosophy of money was save it, save it. Uh, uh, don't spend it. it always use uh, sales and coupons, <laughs> 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 which is still, I mean, those voices in me are like the voices of God. If I can get something at a cheaper price, I really feel I've pleased God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think God cares, really, as long as I have sympathy and caring for the poor. Uh, but, boy, that's deep in me. It's just primal. And I've even said it in my talks, you know, people's attitude towards sex and money and authority mm-hmm. are all in the shadow world where they're not even easy to talk about logically because people have such deep, irrational, those are the three biggies as far as I can see. Um, and that was certainly true of money. And your book did more, I'm not saying this because I'm on radio, I guess, but did more to educate me. I I wish I had more say inside of the religious orders. And I like to say Jesuits, Franciscans, Dominicans, Christian brothers, which you had here. Uh, I think before you take a vow of poverty, you would do well to read this book. Not just us, but 
to recognize you have some internalized attitudes, many of which are not gospel at all. Mm -hmm. And like I, I equated saving money with observing my vow of poverty. We, we used to say, we do everything cheaply in the Franciscans. <laughs> or no, no, we do everything poorly. <laughs> That's the way we said it. We do, and there was truth to that. Oh, my. We thought if we did it poorly, I mean, you, you know, the cathedral here. Yes. We had it till the year 2000, and it was okay. But we had to get out of there and give it to the diocesan priests before your cathedral really got fixed up because hmm. our idea is do it as cheap as possible and that's going to please god i don't think it's always worked at all mm -hmm. you know and uh, let me say one more thing forgive me for going so long on this but uh actually in the original franciscan vision beauty was identified with the nature of god hmm. and beauty was supposed to be a part of truth. The Dominicans emphasized truth. We emphasized love and beauty. And we were supposed to take that with us in our evangelization. Like you, you see it in the California missions. Charming architecture, really. There's no way to say it isn't charming. And if we still would have had most of our New Mexico missions, they were that they weren't functional buildings, they were beautiful buildings insofar as they could. Uh, but we lost that, I'm afraid. Mm. We became, as most of the church did, very functional, practical, uh, and I, I felt your book was helping me at least Bring those back together again. You can still be functional and honor beauty and goodness and truth. <laughs> uh, it takes work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come naturally to the American anymore. But um, I think you're gonna. I think you're gonna grow up a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Well, That's he certainly has with me. I've grown up quite a bit with it, and I and and the the. Challenge and the opportunity is to put what you read in that book into practice, yes. and then you see that yes. it actually is meaningful. It can be transformative. Doug, I just want to ask you, I mean, you're sitting here listening to <laughs> Father Richard, a, a, not only a, a, an incredible uh, spiritual leader, but certainly has led a lot of people through the books that he's written himself, mm -hmm. including uh, being able to to share that on national audiences with people like Oprah and <laughs> and others. But here he is with us yeah, on amazing. Your Money Matters, <laughs> and you just heard no, him give a critique of your <laughs> of your book. How does it feel? Well, it feels amazing. And thanks, Richard, for for being on the show and Easy. and for even just uh, glancing Easy. at my book. I appreciate Effortless. it. And um, and maybe what I'd like to do before we jump really deeply into it is to uh, tell the audience a little bit about my intent, which I shared with you yeah, earlier, good. which is that your recent book, Universal Christ, I think, in my opinion, and, and you can push back on this if you like, I, not only is it a magnum opus for you, a crowning achievement in a long literary career, but... I think it's also a spiritual classic that is going to be foundational. It's certainly foundational for me and for millions of people around the world for whom it is just this clarion call uh, for an, a deeper understanding of the perennial tradition, of the contemplative tradition. And I'd like to just summarize it, if I may, in my own oh, words, and then, and then I'd like to take it as an axiomatic postulate. Now, but what I mean by that is as a philosophical foundation that we're, we're not here, at least I, I don't want to really debate your book so much as accept it as something that really rings true across, I think, all religious traditions um, and faith traditions as really embodying the heart of the contemplative tradition and the mystical experience that, that it's so well thought out, it's so well grounded theologically that what I'd love to do is to do something a little different than what you might get on Oprah, because okay. I think Oprah does a brilliant job of summarizing the book and a brilliant job of teasing out the content of the book for an audience. And let's just, if, if you haven't read the book or you haven't had experience with it, I would really encourage everyone to read it 
you know, go watch some of your interviews and your po- other podcasts, and then let's jump and see what the wider implication of universal Christ might mean looking forward into other disciplines, what the, what the larger vision might be carrying out sort of long, what your legacy might be moving out into, into history with the universal Christ. Does that make sense? Wow, that's ambitious, but with you leading me, I'll just try as best I can to follow. That's all. So here, let me put universal Christ in my own words in a few sentences, and then you tell me if yes. I got it right. But the, the heart of it is the understanding that mystical experience of God being in everyone and in everything. Yes. Is that, is that simplest enough? I mean, I know there's a way more commentary, but is that the heart of the book? That's the heart of the book, but before people turn off their radio, mm-hmm. the natural knee-jerk response of most Christians mm-hmm. is, well, that sounds like pantheism to me, or that sounds like New Age superficial thinking. Mm-hmm. So I, I just want to say this much, that uh, uh, an Orthodox Christian is not a pantheist, mm-hmm. where wherein God and uh reality are the same thing. Mm -hmm. They equal one another. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's going to seem like a subtle distinction, but it really isn't. You have to maintain the distinction and then reunite them (laughs) uh, like we do in uh, other doctrines. And the the real belief is panentheism. Which you know from your Greek mm-hmm. means God in all things. Mm-hmm. And you know, I can remember I'm an old time Catholic, at least in my early education. We were raised on a horrible, wonderful little document called the Baltimore Catechism. And it was question 16, you know, and we had to memorize the answers. And sister would say, where is God? And all of us would give our answer, God is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that was the correct answer. Mm -hmm. And then much of the rest of the Baltimore Catechism, in effect, said, we really don't mean that. (laughs) God isn't really everywhere. God's only in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm in the bread of the Eucharist, Mm -hmm. and even that in a mass that was validly celebrated. Well, you see what you end up with, a God who is largely empty from the universe, Yes, hardly anywhere. You're right. For all practical pastoral purposes, God was hardly anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we had to undo that. And it's been coming, but... Uh, I I think the reason I'm getting away with it, if I can put it that way, I really haven't received thus far. I'm aware of one nasty negative review, but not much because their intuition knows that it's true. Right. Uh, that's my my guess, and because of my age, they figure it's not worth kicking me out now or calling me a heretic <laughs> to let him die off, you know. <laughs> and we also, you know, I'm living in this wonderful age of Pope Francis, a marvelous archbishop here in Santa Fe now, who I, he, he had me over for dinner a few weeks ago, and a Franciscan superior who, uh, who he, in fact, he used the same word you did. He read it from cover to cover. He said, this is your monium opus now you can die in peace. I said, really? And he's much more an intellectual than I am. I'm not an intellectual. I'm a, a Franciscan popularizer. Mm. But I was taught enough good academic theology to know how to teach it so people can't dismiss me too lightly. So let me ask you, this is an, uh, an off-topic question, but do you see yourself more as... I mean, the, the, the spiritual wisdom in there is brilliant. But it's also, you're standing on the shoulders of giants, as we all That's are. That's right. right. That's right. So do you see yourself more, at, and maybe I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth here, but do you see yourself more as a spiritual giant, or do you see yourself as more of as a, as a teacher, a, a, yeah. a master teacher? Yes. It seems like you, you more than anyone else, are the, are the master teacher of this perennial tradition that we, we've sort of lost 
and that your your communication skills, your writing skills, your speaking skills are so spectacular that you've been able to make this a popular, uh, yeah. pop, bring it out to the masses in, yeah, a health, in a healthy way. You're flattering me, but... Uh, God did make it easy for me to talk. I, I don't understand it because I was a B student. I'm not really an intellectual at all. The only way I can communicate and convince people that these are not just my ideas, why should they believe one little Franciscan living in New Mexico? Mm -hmm. I have to hook my train to the perennial tradition. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, the Franciscans trained me in. Mm -hmm. The pre-Christian literature, including the Hebrew scriptures, the even the intertestamental literature, the New Testament. But then the gift we were given as Catholics, mm -hmm. and this is why I am glad for all the weaknesses of Catholicism. I'm glad I was educated in Catholic theology because we had to take every doctrine and dogma and study it historically. Mm -hmm. First century, second century, third century. What do we do with this emerging concept of grace, let's say, or, or whatever it might be, and study the councils of the church, the fathers of the church, the mothers of the desert. I, I, I really got a almost as good an education as you get at St. John's <laughs> in Santa Fe. But mine was all theological, uh -huh. of course. Yeah. I mean, we really, uh, not being able to date and not having children, we had nothing else to do for eight years but study, you know? And little did I think it would help me this much. Wow. And I remember my systematics professor saying, Richard, uh, not Richard, but to the whole class. I want to uh, put you in touch with the scriptures and the tradition mm -hmm. so well that you can theologize for yourself. Yeah, and you do it brilliantly. And little did I think that's what I'd end up doing. But naturally, there are those who think I'm a heretic, and I'm really not. I mean, what I'm saying in this book is very clear in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But as you probably know, you can only see what you're told to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were told to pay attention to some very different texts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let me tee up my first real big question for you, which is, so if God is in all things, is God in money? Yes. And what does that mean? Has to be. Has to be. So it's sort of a softball question, but the harder follow-up mm -hmm. is then what does that mean for our economic systems and our understanding or our attitude towards money? The only real sin in the Hebrew Scriptures is idolatry, mm -hmm. right? If we would have taught people in medio stat virtus, vir virtue stands in the middle, mm -hmm. not over-attachment, not ascetic detachment. Mm -hmm. Now, I think even starting with the Desert Fathers and even the Franciscans, mm -hmm. we thought the way to not get over-attached was to emphasize detachment. Mm -hmm. And it, it feels like Christianity is growing up. I've said for years that we're growing a year a century, and that isn't much off in our ability to comprehend the cosmic Christ. The message of the gospel is so huge, so non-dual, mm -hmm. I'll return to that, I'm sure, that the, the controlling egotistical mind can't understand it. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if we've grown a year a century, we're about 21. We're, <laughs> we're young adults, and we're beginning to say, my God, what if this is what it means? Mm. So, with, so with that in mind, where do you see your book? I mean, what, so given that this, and this is my assumption, and forgive me for putting words in your mouth, but if if the spiritual journey never ends right we're never That's right. It's, it's never going to we're never going to top out at some point where we've figured it all out um, where in that chronology do you see universal christ is it at age 30 is that a 30 year old age is that a 40 year old mm -hmm. wisdom is it is it the cuz what what needs to come after universal christ is really my, my big biggest question and where do you see yourself pulling that the story of christianity forward 
There's so many ways I could come at that. All I can ever trust is the first idea that comes into my mind, which isn't always the best. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm going to use a schema, which you don't have to know Mm -hmm. for me to use. It's called integral theory or spiral dynamics. Mm -hmm. And it tries to chart the levels of consciousness, Mm -hmm. how they are mirrored in the growth of an individual from an infant to an old man, and they're mirrored mirrored in human history. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most of us just got up to old age. But there was always another tradition, which we call the wisdom tradition. Seems to have been achieved by a minority because they were usually suppressed or repressed or punished or called heretics. And only from that level can you begin to think Mm non-dually. And now the most easy way to understand that is instead of either or, both and, Mm -hmm. both and. It comes naturally to a mystic. Mm -hmm. It comes naturally to people who have suffered deeply and who have loved deeply Mm -hmm. in that state Mm -hmm. of deep love or deep suffering. Mm -hmm. They often lose it afterwards, you know, but they touch upon it. And that readiness for God has been available since the Stone Age. I'm going to say it that way. It isn't. It's nothing that can be organized. Mm -hmm. It's the nature of being. Mm -hmm. And it pulls you into an immense love affair with what is. And then that love affair makes you suffer for what is. Mm -hmm. So they finally become one. But that's the mind uh, that can conceive easily of the cosmic Christ. Mm-hmm. It, it, it doesn't think Christ is Jesus' last name, mm-hmm. as I say in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, the book came out six months ago. Uh, and the crowds that I have talked to about it, I've never had anyone, once you say it, oh, yeah, Christ can't be his last name. Mr. and Mrs. Christ, a <laughs> little baby Christ. <laughs> uh, but we've acted as if mm-hmm. that were the case. So it clearly says in the first chapter of Ephesians, Colossians, the prologue to John's gospel, the first paragraph of Hebrews, the first paragraph of First John, all say in the first uh, paragraph or chapter, Rather clearly, the Christ existed from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the question that is asked of me, rightly so, is, well, is the universe eternal? Mm. It's interesting to me that the Roman church never allowed us to make a judgment on that. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. They, for once, didn't pretend to know. Mm -hmm. And they said we... Uh, you know, claim wholly unknowing. We don't know. Well, let me ask you this question based on what you started, you mentioned a moment ago, which is that you've written in Universal Christ that great love requires, or excuse me, great love requires great suffering. Will lead to it, yeah. Will lead to it. Yeah. Okay. You won't become a great lover until you're stretched. Okay. Go go ahead. Go ahead. And your, your love... Uh, seems to encompass the whole world. Well, I wish I could say that. Believe me, I have a hard time loving the president. I have to pray every day <laughs> that I could do that. So it doesn't come easily. Well, it doesn't come easy to any of us. No, but no. If it, if it was, if it did, that would be a, a spiritual cheat. <laughs> That's a good way. Right? Yeah. But you have this immense capacity for love, certainly in your writing, that, that I think is why people are so gravitated towards it. Your love, your compassion, your kindness towards all really is... On my better days. On your better Thank days. Thank you for <laughs> flattering me. But, but it yeah, comes it comes yeah. through in your writing, and, and, and okay, I think that's why people so. trust you so <clears throat> much. So so here's my hard question for you is, what is the cross that you carry? What what's your, what's the source of suffering for you that led that you went through that led you to this great love? Struggling most of my life with the absurdity of life, mm-hmm. 
the tragic, unjust situation we are thrown into. Uh, everything about my own temperament uh, has always said and still says, it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's why I became a priest. It was, how can I mop it up? You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> Give me a pulpit every Sunday and I'll do what I can. Uh, I have to fight every day the voices of cynicism. Mm -hmm. Because to just look at the state of the world, how human beings treat human beings. Uh, and it never stops. And, you know, we thought, we who were raised in the modernist period, that, okay, this line of evolution was a straight line, and we everything was getting better and better. And then the very continent that is the most Christian, Europe, produces the two world wars. Oh, right. <laughs> uh. Uh, and I'm German. I mean, you want to meet educated people, go to Germany. Mm -hmm. Education, education, education. They put us to shame. And I've taught a lot in Germany. They have wonderful questions. They're, they're so smart. And yet both wars. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll come back around to this, what that taught a lot of us. But that constant confrontation with what Miguel de Nomino called the tragic sense of life. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the Bible really leads you, if you're honest about the Bible. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give answers for everything. No. It really doesn't. Evangelicals are being told a lie. It gives you a way to survive inside of absurdity, mm -hmm. but it doesn't nix the absurdity. You know. That's clear. All these chapters of wars and rapes and killings of children. I mean, that's why we Catholics, we didn't read the Bible. We didn't like all those terrible stories. <laughs> we didn't know how to transform them, you know. Well, then let me ask you another big question, right? So if so, again, but the, since we're using the universal Christ as a philosophical foundation, is there a particular area you think we could touch on right now that we could talk about, maybe brainstorm about how do we might bring the universal Christ into action, whether that be through art and theater, story, mm. politics, economics, mm. psychology, sexuality. Where do you think is the most easiest ingress to begin to spread the vision of universal Christ out into other disciplines so it has that lasting impact I think it deserves to have? Well, first we got to convince religion itself. Mm -hmm. When the God that religion presents is tyrannical, dualistic, exclusionary, upset most of the time, we just we have no credibility mm -hmm. with much of the world. Now, I, I admit that those other wonderful fields that you listed are marvelous entranceways, but they they pay no attention to us in the world of religion anymore. Well, to, but to be fair, there's millions of people who are listening to you, and, they, and they're separate from the hierarchy of the church, and they are separate from the theology uh, in terms of having the ability to craft it or, or, yeah. or, or implement it, and they're living their day-to-day -day lives, and they've, they've read this book, and it's been meaningful to them, and it, since it's the heart of the contemplative tradition, and your in your nonprofit, the Center for Contemplation and Action, um, is that the right con, uh, con, yeah, I just switch them around. <laughs> action and contemplation. I deliberately put action, action for, first. I'll so, explain later. And, and, matter. and that makes sense to me. But but the Universal Christ is really about that contemplative tradition. How do you bring? Is there a, is there a next book that's that you need to that's missing? That or where is the action part? come from out of the universal Christ? Yeah, if this realization, mm -hmm. and that's what it is, it's a unitive realization, mm -hmm. which should be the goal of all religion, mm -hmm. to lead you to unitive thinking. Mm -hmm. That's our word for non-dual. Mm -hmm. uh, should allow you to uh, see the world in wholes mm -hmm. instead of in parts. Mm -hmm. And you just can't keep splitting it up. 
that this part is sacred and this part is not sacred. Mm -hmm. The mind prefers dualistic binaries, mm -hmm. male, female, gay, straight, black, white, American, Mexican. Mm -hmm. It's just where we, where we most comfortably go. And then we grab onto one side and make mm -hmm. it superior to the other. Mm -hmm. This is almost the only game left mm -hmm. in town. It, it breaks your heart after a while. And that tells me that religion has not been doing its job. Mm -hmm. So would, here's a, a, to, to throw an idea out. Is then the vision of universal Christ such that we need to break down the barriers between the disciplines to have an integrative vision? Is it, is it the, the dualistic thinking that we think that art and politics and science and economics mm -hmm. are separate? Is that part of yes, the problem? Of course. Some are sacred and some are mm -hmm. mundane, like money. Yeah. We were always dismissing. My first w well-known book was a book called Everything Belongs. Mm -hmm. And I realized there's a straight line from that book t to this book. Because <laughs> I'm still, 25 years later, saying the same thing. I hope I'm saying it better mm -hmm. and with more confidence. But we, you know, the Christian religion is mostly known, I don't think this is an exaggeration, by what it excludes, mm -hmm. who doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you don't belong, you don't belong, you don't belong, you don't belong. And then we sit there smugly, mm -hmm. you know, a whole church of white, comfortable people mm -hmm. who are barely excited because <laughs> the message is so unexciting at that point. And I say that after celebrating Mass mm -hmm. in churches for 50 years yeah. next year. So I know it's true. I'm not trying to be cynical. I, I'm still fighting my cynicism, however. Uh, so, I, And yet I can't give up on religion. If it helps, mm -hmm. I'm still a priest in good standing. Mm -hmm. No one can believe it. <laughs> uh, but I am because they know this is not heresy. Right. But it can only be seen by a non-dual mind by a mind that knows how to think both and. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking either or. The trouble, and I'm not trying to be anti-Protestant in saying this, and, and we need in Martin Luther's sola scriptura. Mm -hmm. But sola scriptura, only scripture, set us up for 500 years of dualistic, Mm -hmm. Thinking. Once right. you say only, yes. you're dualistic again. You're also ending, aren't you sort of putting a cap on the spiritual adventure? A bit? Yeah, oh, what a wonderful way to say it. Yeah. That's right. You know, And we Catholics needed a little scripture. Mm -hmm. But once it's only scripture, all truth is found in scripture? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yeah, no. I'm not even close. Right. Uh, and that doesn't mean I have to throw out Scripture. Mm -hmm. And we see this lasting till our day, that we're presented again and again with false alternatives. Build a wall or let everybody into the country who wants to come in. Mm -hmm. And it's actually presented with those stupid alternatives. Right. Huh? And people, yes, sir, we're going to build a wall so we don't have to let everybody in. That there's 55 intelligent alternatives between those two mm -hmm. doesn't enter most people's minds because religion has not been doing its job. Yeah. So here's a, maybe a, a philosophical uh, riddle. Where is God not? Yeah. The Psalms say that. You know, if you go up to the heavens, he is there, of course. But you go down to the earth, he is there. You go under the water, he is there. There's no way God is not. Well, here's a. This is a. This is. I don't mean this in the literal sense of. Yes. of use the word hell, right? We have a oh, historical yes. baggage of that, right? Yes. But would it be fair to, as a as a intellectual mind game to yes. say that the only place where God is not would be hell? And if we exclude God from our economic systems, our political systems, our discourse, we're setting ourselves up for a kind of hell on earth. Is that too much of a stretch? No, no. Let me but just back up a little bit. And knowing that most Catholics don't know this, certainly evangelicals. I mean, the last two conservative popes, mm -hmm. John Paul II and Benedict XVI, both denied the geographical location mm -hmm. of a place called hell. Mm -hmm. 
John Paul II said, when will Catholics understand that hell is a state of consciousness, mm. not a location? Yes. Uh, how come that didn't get any press? <laughs> and then uh, Benedict XVI, who I'm no big fan of either one of them, really, uh, and yet they both said some good things. You're right. They had good minds. And Benny, he says, excuse me, Benedict the Sixteenth, he says uh, uh, in the Apostles' Creed, it says he descended into hell. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And he gives a very glib answer for a pope. He says, well, if he descended into it, it can't exist anymore. Ooh. He obliterated hell. Now, that was maintained in a lot of phraseology, like the harrowing of hell. Mm -hmm. That's the way the evangelicals speak of it. Mm -hmm. And in the Eastern Church art, where Easter Sunday, Jesus pulling people out of hell. It's over. Mm -hmm. And then, so to, to take that notion of hell being a state of mind, of consciousness, yes. when we look at M modernity, modern society, and we look at school shootings and yes. the, the 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 rage that we see yes. blowing up on Twitter every day. Um, are we creating hell on earth? Of course. By our exclusion yeah. of the perennial tradition of the universal Christ from our consciousness as a civilization. We have to, and even the other world religions do, mm -hmm. posit some notion of hell. Mm -hmm. It might have different metaphors because without it, we are not free. Mm -hmm. And we have to maintain free will. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be free to say no to God or we're robots. Right. So, but here, what the early Desert Fathers already said is love could not allow, speaking of the infinite love of God, Love could not allow the infinite death or torture of any one of God's creatures. Mm -hmm. So it's not a permanent state no. that it can never be rescued from. That's the way they saw it, yeah. you know, that it describes you're free to choose hell and you're going to create a lot of hell mm -hmm. in this world. It's probably what we Catholics were doing when we posited, and that's all it was, it was a folk religion that people thought was grand dogma, the notion of purgatory. Mm -hmm. What we were doing in that was the same thing the Eastern religions did with reincarnation. Mm -hmm. We gave the divine wiggle room. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's still room to say yes to God. I've worked with a lot of hospice workers in the last 10 years, especially. And the the vast majority of them will say something like this, that most people get it in the last three minutes, that some put it off that long, mm -hmm. but we'll start smiling at the end, or we'll start trusting at the end. Mm -hmm. Most people, not everybody. Mm -hmm. And now, I hate to say this, they say some of the people who have the hardest time dying are these real, rigid Catholics and Christians. Yeah, that was my grandfather. He was dying of cancer and yeah. up to his deathbed, never acknowledged, even, even acknowledged the cancer in his death. Wow. And he just fought it the whole time. And it was a very bitter end, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm afraid it is. If you're taught that God is Zeus, mm -hmm. you know, or making a list, checking it twice, Santa Claus, mm -hmm. you don't trust this God. You don't love this God. You're afraid of this Well, how God. could you? Because how you, could you? Because you know your inner state. We all know yeah. inside we're all a mess. That's right. And so if we're... None of us have done it right. And even if, if we're looking for the judgment of God upon us, That's it's right. always going to be negative. Cause there our, you go. Right. You know, our, our early authority voices tend to be what's projected and accepted as our image of God. Mm -hmm. And that's why parenting is so important. People who really had uh, at least one unconditionally loving parent, that's all it takes, they're able to believe the good news much easier. Mm -hmm. But if both of your parents were tyrants, 
They have a hard time. Yeah. Now, when they break through, I was jail chaplain in Albuquerque for 14 years. And, um, gee, I, I just got to see, I mean, a lot of people hated ministers and priests because they thought you were coming in to, to lay this on them again. <laughs> Retributive justice, mm -hmm. reward punishment, yeah. the lowest level of consciousness. Uh, then when they found out you didn't, they'd start giving you a listening ear. Yeah. But I remember some of them saying to me, that's too good to be true. You're just making it up. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we call it good news. <laughs> you know, it's too good to be true. Yeah. See, the human mind, and I was told this by a neuroscientist, the human mind cannot form any idea of infinity or eternity. Hmm. So when you're told God is infinite, infinite love, there's no place for that to lodge in this brain. That makes sense. Now, if it's a threat, <laughs> for some reason it does lodge. Eternal punishment, our fear takes over and that one lodges, you right. know. But infinite love, I don't know. I've never seen that on this earth. But you've experienced, you've had mystical experiences yes. where you you feel yeah. that love embodied yes. in everything yes. you see. Uh -huh. So is, but that's not a, it's a different kind of knowing. How do you reconcile those two somewhat contradictory ideas of God? You can't understand the infinite love of God and as you in your opening for Universal Christ, you describe I forgot the 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 woman on the train experience that you uh, who, start the book with. You start the book yeah. with, but but isn't that an experiential understanding yes. of the infinite love of God? You know, one of the best one-liners to teach this is Saint John of the Cross, the mm -hmm. Spanish mystic, and he says God refuses to be known by thinking. Mm. By thinking, never. God always will be known by loving, by participation, always. Now, that's a different, what we were called in philosophy, you would understand, a different epistemology. Mm -hmm. We call it the turn toward, the turn back toward participation. What created the Enlightenment and postmodernism and deconstruction was the subject-object split, where I knew things by standing over here with a smart education from St. John's University, <laughs> forgive me, uh, able to analyze everything and critique it. Um, you may, as long as you maintain the subject-object split, mm -hmm. with you being the elite knower, mm -hmm. I know, and I... Uh, this is what uh, the first chapter of the Bible warns us against. You may eat of all of the trees in the garden, mm -hmm. which is an amazing permission. Amazing permission. There's only one tree you may not eat of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which most religion has eaten voraciously mm -hmm. from, that I know who's going to heaven. Mm. I know who God loves. I know God doesn't love black people and gay people. Mm -hmm. or those are the current, right. you know, iterations. It, it changes every century. So what do you think the original intent um, psychologically of that metaphor of the, the tree of good and evil means on its deeper level beyond just right, wrong, good, bad, I judge, the I, thou? Is there, is there something that you think that... What's the wisdom, though, that it contains? It, it's, it's dualistic thinking, mm -hmm. that, that I know what good is and I know what evil is. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus says that in his words, the last will be first and the first be, will be last. Mm -hmm. The Spirit will come, John's Gospel says, and show you who was in the right. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus' attitude toward prostitutes, mm -hmm. you know, he's basically saying, be prepared to be surprised. Mm -hmm. And who, what hearts have really been broken open, and what hearts 
are, are stone cold closed. Mm-hmm. These are the people who killed Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's rather clear. It's the religious zealots that we call the scribes and the Pharisees. They're the real villains mm-hmm. in the New Testament. Not secular people. Of course, secularism didn't exist then. But the, the bona fide religious people. So be prepared to be surprised, which leads you to stop your judging. Mm -hmm. Exactly what uh, Pope Francis said on the plane about gay gay Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You know, who am I to judge? Right. Right. So so the tree of good and evil is either or thinking. Well, here's another. This is not my idea. I'm just paraphrasing other thinkers um, here. But one. One idea that's been posited about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is essentially that's the the thing that separates us from animals in the sense of we understand that our actions have consequences in the future, and so there's a it's not so much perhaps and I'm it's, I'm, 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 I'm glad, hypothesizing yeah, here good. one interpretation isn't just r- about. Um, right and wrong, that's one sort of mm. lower level but on that s- sort of spiral upward that you were describing earlier. On a higher level, maybe another way of looking at it is that it's an acknowledgement of the fact that we can project our minds into a future unlike an animal can do, and we see at the end of our future our death, and we see negative consequences, and we're trying to optimize our experience in the uh, individually, collectively, but that there's some really there's a real problem that that consciousness that it's it's pointing to a problem inherent in the very nature of consciousness that's, right. that's unique to the human species. That's right. Does that sound fair? So, so knowing by participation mm-hmm. uh, instead of knowing by observation. Mm-hmm. Let's use that word. Mm-hmm. That's what science taught us, and science is good. It created the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution. So I'm not throwing out dualistic thinking. Mm -hmm. It's good as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. Now, it hits a ceiling. Mm -hmm. And above the ceiling, when I wrote my book on this called The Naked Now, uh, I said there's five things above the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Now I'd add a sixth. When I wrote the book, I death. Suffering, love, God, honestly spoken of, Mm -hmm. and any notion of infinity or eternity. Mm -hmm. Those cannot be processed with the dualistic logical mind. Mm -hmm. The one I added since then is sex. Mm -hmm. I really don't think you can make sense, you know out of two bodies loving to crawl over one another <laughs> and getting such immense... I mean, the, the laws of reality we will change to do this. Mm-hmm. That's not subject to logic. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason we have such pure, uh, poor, poor uh, sexual teaching mm-hmm. is because we tried to teach sexual ethics rationally. Mm-hmm. It's in the realm of mystery. You know, does that help at all? It does. And since you bring up the question of sex, this is, this is everybody sort of... Everybody loves to go there. Always. Everybody does. And <laughs> everybody, I, I, but especially men. I, well, I was I prepping think. for this interview, and I was asking some friends, well, what questions would you like to ask of Richard Rohr? And the question of sex came up always over does. and over again. Yeah. And and we've talked a little bit in private about that. And, and it seems like even some of our private mm-hmm. conversations... We end up there quite frequently. And so my question really is, you know, hierarchy issues aside, leaving the hierarchy aside. Yes. You know, Don't keep beating that. It's yeah, not worth it. It's its, its own mm. beast and, mm-hmm. you know, it's another discussion. But what's the root cause of the sexual predation crisis in the church? And you now you spent a lot of time counseling abusive priests up in uh, Hamas Springs. What have you learned from those experiences? You know, we've, what's become common in most of our circles today is the word culture, mm-hmm. how hard it is to change a culture. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, Google has its own culture. Mm-hmm. The police force of Santa Fe has its own culture. The CAC that I founded has its own culture. We fortunately got a wonderful director now who's really making it shine. But 
boy, it's taken him five years of work mm -hmm. to do that. I believe the reason uh, unhealthy, very unhealthy sexual behavior was allowed to grow and fester disguised is uh, because of the culture of clericalism. Mm. Clericalism is our word for the boys' club of the church, where you're, you're sort of considered untouchable. Mm -hmm. My new book on evil, which will come out in November or December, anything that's untouchable, uncriticizable, uh, will soon become evil. Mm. I know that sounds like an overstatement. No. You leave anything uncriticized, uncritiqued. Well, the church, the clergy held themselves for centuries. Mm -hmm. And God bless you, good laity, you bought into it. <laughs> Father's always right, you know. And so many of them were holy good people. Like, uh, you're not old enough to remember Father Jerome mm -hmm. here oh, at the yeah. Yeah. yeah, Absolutely. He touched so many lives. Mm -hmm. I, st I never knew him. Mm -hmm. But he, he, you know, and... It was uh, amazing how a few good ones like that mm -hmm. would allow you to overlook all the rest of it. Well, uh, you well know. let me dig a little deeper because oh, that, that's, that's, that's still a hierarchical issue, though. Yes. It, so, so what is it about – so having been a monastic and celibate for yes. 20 years and we both have some – you know, you get behind the cloister wall, so to speak, mm -hmm. and, and you sort of understand the life of, of the celibate or the life of, of the priestly life that, that you've experienced. It seems, and again, I'm putting some words in your mouth, so forgive me if I'm, no, go ahead. If I'm doing that, but that there's almost um, the, the celibate vow itself may attract or seems to That's attract right. people who, who are um, don't want to deal with their sexuality don't want to deal with or them. have some issues that are quite uh, disturbing and they're hiding behind that yeah, celibate vow. That's not too strong a word. They don't even know mm -hmm. they're hiding. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of us didn't know what our penis was when we came to the minor seminary. <laughs> this was the old church, you know. Mm -hmm. It was just denied, repressed. Uh, the shadow is that which you don't want to know about yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if gayness was repressed as well as it was the amount of men i've worked with who who only could admit they were gay in their 50s mm -hmm. just blows your mind mm -hmm. but imagine how deeply pedophilia mm -hmm. they had to really uh you know deny deeply mm -hmm. what do you now I mean, this is an awkward question but what is do you have any sense of where the origination of pedophilia may come from in the priests that you've counseled uh, over the years, is there any any themes or any any insight you can give to those of us who for whom it feels so alien? It feels so. Yes. It, I can't so even desire the bodies of little children. Me, it just right, seems so strange. And, and so, so it's one thing that I think for us to have compassion towards, like you see a homeless person on the street. Mm. My compassion for their suffering is um, sort of natural. Or you see someone loses a child or yes. most sufferings of individuals we can put our compassion or empathy forgive me if i'm getting them wrong uh, it comes in part from being able to see yourself in the other person's shoes yeah. there but for the grace of god go i yeah. and pedophilia seems to be that one thing one thing that, which how can we ever legitimate that and, and we can't legitimate we don't want yeah. to legitimate we it we but, don't want to but how yeah. do we um understand, understand it yeah there's still a huge building, not huge, but a sizable building mm -hmm. up in Hamas Springs mm -hmm. where 20 pedophiles still live. Mm -hmm. They can't be released to society because no one can assure they won't act out mm -hmm. when they're around children. And, and I know some of them personally. Mm -hmm. It breaks your heart. The first thing you see is a kind of emotional immaturity, a kind of sort of talking in... I don't know what else to say, sort of childish ways. He doesn't feel like he's a man's man. He doesn't feel like he's a man you'd take seriously mm -hmm. or want to go out and have a drink with, mm -hmm. you know. Now, because I got to talk to so many of them personally, I, I have to say, and I, who am I to make a statistic, but the vast majority of them 
had been uh, assaulted as little boys themselves. Mm -hmm. Your first sexual fascinations where the sexual urge is first awakened in you, whatever imagery that is, it's like the imprinting on a little baby duck. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's with you forever Mm -hmm. on some level. Now, some people move partially beyond it, but a lot of people cannot move beyond it, you know? Let me tell you a story. I hope this you can cut it out if you don't want to. I gave it was giving a retreat in Iowa, oh, 30 years ago. And it was all these Iowa farm, uh, priest retreat. Mm-hmm. All these Iowa farm boys who'd become priests. And this one said to me, can we take a walk? I... I want to share something with you. And I said, oh, sure, let's do it. It was a summer evening. We had a nice long long dirt road to walk on. And he started just shaking as he told me. He said, I was in a big farm family. And uh, we'd all come home at dinner after work or school. And we were all vying for our dad's attention. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was the littlest one. And what I would do, and he just started sobbing when he said this, I'd crawl under the table. No one would even miss me. There were so many kids in the family. And I couldn't get Dad's attention. So I'd play with his manure-covered boots. And then he just broke down. He says, I know you're going to think I'm sick. You're the only person I've ever told this, but... I can't get an erection unless I smell manure. Wow. Now, how do you hate someone like that, Mm. you know? So heartbreaking. That was his first experience. All the other kids had dad's attention. Mm. And he, he did come out as gay eventually. And I'm not saying that's a template for every gay person, right. not by any means. But it, his first desire for intimacy was with a man, his father. And he could only get it by, I got his boot down here. Mm. And all the other kids might have his face, but I got his boot. In that, I mean, how could you hate such a person? Uh, I, I'd love to know where he's at today. But the amount of stories like that I was told over the years, Mm -hmm. he was imprinted Mm -hmm. with the association of sexual fascination with boots and manure and uh, his dad. Wow. And then just stuck with him. And there's no way. Stuck with him. Sure. And he was fascinated by older men, too. And then how do you you unprint that once it's— You you don't. You don't. God must. You know, the one who knows everything and understands everything is the one who could forgive everything. Mm -hmm. God must just weep over the way we make these people suffer even more. Mm -hmm. But you made a good point. Because a pedophile so wounds little children, we can't set them loose. Yeah. I don't know the answer to it. Father Fitzgerald, who founded the community up here in Hamas Springs, he's still buried up there. He was actually, when he died, uh, negotiating to buy an island. (laughs) An island. He was so naive in many ways. An island off the coast of California Mm -hmm. where he said, I'm going to take my bad priests and and keep them away from children. Mm. So he still loved them. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. I, so uh, a, a college, well, he's a, he was a good friend at the time, and we lost track over the years, but he just finished a 14-year prison sentence for uh, having pedophilic imagery and soliciting something. Oh, yeah. He was soliciting something online that he shouldn't have been soliciting for. The police came and took him away and put him in jail for a very long yeah. time. And um, then when you meet him and you hear his story, his childhood is nothing but a series of horror stories of, of abuse. Course. And, you know, he was, he was an orphan and he went from one foster family to another foster Always. family, horribly abused. And then you feel pity and, and, and sorrow for the suffering that he endured as a child. And then he's engaging in truly horrific acts as an yes. adult. And you, you can't, yes. it's just like, how do you reconcile those two things? Because the, 
the the intuition of a of a someone who's not familiar with that world would be well because you experienced the horror as a child you would be the last person yes you would think you would think you'd be the last person to try to and it's not subject to rationale yeah it's above the ceiling mm-hmm. yeah. yeah it's uh there's the tragic sense of life again mm-hmm. uh, so i just finished my what i hope will be my last monograph what do we do with evil Mm. Uh, don't get me into it. It'll okay. take too long. All right. Well, <laughs> Although it's only about 130 pages. But uh, we've got to recognize that evil is not the nasty things that you do and you do and I mm-hmm. do, although we all do. Mm-hmm. It's this corporate collective absurdity mm-hmm. that we're forced to live in. And we share the absurdity. Mm-hmm. And I think Paul says this, especially in Romans. But we read Paul in terms of individual salvation, not in terms of historical salvation. Well, that brings up one of my other big questions for you today, which is so we can might tie this in, which really is, you know, all great religions of the world seem to be shipwrecked on the question of evil. Oh, yeah. So if an all-loving God is incarnating through everything and as everything— why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? Let me just try to talk around it. Okay. Uh, there's never an answer I'm going to give or I've read in any book, even C.S. Lewis and those who try, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, it seems that for history to unfold and evolve, there needs to be pushback. There needs to be a villain. There needs to be a, a, uh, uh, the creating of a space of freedom whereby I can choose for it or against it. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it is the fly in the ointment for many people. Why evil at all? And I can't wait to ask God if you're allowed to ask God <laughs> questions. Because even as I teach this, it doesn't satisfy my mind totally. Mm-hmm especially when it's so unjustly distributed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had a rather easy life. And I think of people in, you know, death camps and mm-hmm. who've seen their parents tortured and killed. And how do you maintain your sanity? Uh, and, and this isn't the exception. If you read history, it appears to be the rule, mm-hmm. you know. Barbarism, barbarism century after century. Um, There's no logical answer. I do know, and this is too glib, but I'm still going to say it, it does make some great people emerge. Mm -hmm. But boy, that's a heavy price. It is. For some great people to emerge. Um, Well, let me push you on that a little bit and say, is it possible that part of that necessity for evil is it's the, the best of bad alternatives? That what would what would life look like if there wasn't the possibility for me to choose evil, then I'd have no free will, and that would be pure hell because there would be my actions would have no meaning. That's right. Is that? That's right. Yeah, that works. But you know, most people don't think philosophically and theologically like you and I do. <laughs> they don't. They just, uh, you know, it, they just want to throw out the whole thing. Are you familiar with the Russian mystic Gurdjieff? No. Uh, at least the name. He was a yeah. mystic. Uh-huh. Uh, we teach this in our living school mm-hmm. in Albuquerque. Uh, you pr- you certainly stu- studied Hegel. Oh, sure. All right. Thesis, antithesis, mm-hmm. synthesis. Yep. Now, this is going to take you one step further than that. Ooh. It's mystical knowing. Gurdjieff said history moves forward whenever there's a new arising that seems like a broader, more inclusive uh I'm, I'm not trying to be political, but let's say the civility we enjoyed under Barack Obama, mm-hmm. a president who could talk intelligently, complete a sentence. Answer a question. No, answer a question. No, something about history. And, and we just thought, well, it's just going to be one president after another mm-hmm. at this level. That's called a new arising. 
<coughs> excuse me. He claims whenever there's a new arising, mm-hmm. as certain as the dawn, there will be pushback against it. Mm-hmm. Like the French Revolution, 1789, 1801, we have Napoleon. Yeah. I mean, 11 years later. Mm-hmm. Well, the Weimar Republic and then World War One, World War II. Yeah, yeah it's just... And now here's the best part, though, why it isn't just Hegel's thesis, antithesis, synthesis. He said, when the pushback comes, I believe we're in such a moment right Mm -hmm. now, you have to wait for the X factor. Now, we Christians would call it grace. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, You can't manufacture it. You can't produce it. You can't uh, predict it perfectly. But it always comes. So, so, so here's my question for you on that: right. Is the universal Christ that X factor? And if it's constantly, not, okay, and yeah. so it is. But only when it's re-recognized, okay. you know, as grace filling all the gaps of history. So, the X fact he calls the first arising, holy affirming. Mm-hmm. Let's just play with Obama. I, I know some people are turning off their radio now. Let's call holy denial the present mm-hmm. president. Huh? Sure. Totally wanting to undo everything Obama did. Mm-hmm. It isn't making Obama the last word on the subject. Stay with me. Now we're waiting for the X factor. Without the pushback, there's no critique of holy arising. Mm. Then, then it would become un- adol- well, it would become yeah. unexamined, and then it would become that's evil. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Then you have holy reconciling, mm-hmm. and what we're in a period now. And he says history moves forward this way: three steps forward, two steps backward. Only the saints and the mystics can wait and pray and trust for the emergence of the X factor. Mm. And uh, let's take it to our Catholic Church. You know. We had the Vatican Council. You can't get any authority higher than a council of the church Mm -hmm. in the early 60s when I was in college. Then we have two popes that basically want to undo it. They never admitted it because they couldn't. Uh, But they want to undo it. And then, against all odds, by a group of cardinals that they appointed... They elect Pope Francis. <laughs> How? No, none of us could figure out. They're all sorry they did, of course. How did Pope Francis get elected? You know, I, he's the X factor. Uh-huh. It's always a descent of the New Jerusalem, to use Revelation 21. Something out of nothing. Mm-hmm. Something from nowhere. A new wave of consciousness. A new man, woman, idea. That takes form or takes shape. A book like Universal Christ. Well, you're being too nice to me. (laughs) But, uh, boy, I don't know that we have time to wait until we're all dead. But don't we see maybe today is, you know, the global climate, um, Mm. forgive me, I'm getting, um, uh, strike, global climate strike that all these kids are doing right now as we're Mm. we're recording, they're marching on the plaza. Is that perhaps this... uh, well, is it a counter re- pushback to the pushback? I don't. I think it is, and the fact that it's coming from youth mm-hmm. is so beautiful. Now it's going to give the patriarchs, the clerics, all the more freedom to dismiss it. Mm-hmm. Oh, these are high school kids. What do they know? A lot, uh, actually. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. They have a kind of innocence that isn't so destroyed by our. Cynicism. Well, let me ask you this other big question, since we're, we're talking about global climate change and the potential apocalyptic, uh, certainly transformation of our planet in very negative ways as a result of systemic climate change. So Julian of Norwich, a favorite of both of us, oh, yes. rather optimistically declared back in the day, she said, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Shall be well. Now, if that's true, 
Right? I'm saying this kind of tongue. I'm framing it in kind of a yeah, yeah. kind of a, a, a radical way. Yeah. But how is having a picnic with your family different from going on a murderous rampage mm-hmm. with an AR-15? Mm-hmm. So is is failure an option for the universe? And and if not, then how can our actions have any meaning? If you're a, a Christian believer, then we'd have to say, at least in theory, failure is not an option. Mm. Resurrection is the final chapter of history, Mm -hmm. right? Placed in the middle of history so we know where it's all heading, so we know where it's all going. The trouble uh, with uh, the the way we believed is we thought resurrection was an anomaly, a one-time occurrence in the body of Jesus, Mm -hmm. And later, Mary. We believed in the assumption, too. (laughs) We had to get Mary up there. Uh, But in fact, if you only read one chapter of my book, just read the one on resurrection. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Now quantum physics tells us resurrection, not resuscitation, and you can ask me the difference, uh, is the only pattern there is. There's the same amount of atoms— I'm told, I don't know how to figure this out, Mm -hmm. in the universe today as there were three seconds after the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And they just keep rearranging, rearranging. In our Catholic funeral mass, we say, you know, a life is not ended. It merely changes. But then we don't believe it. Well, but that's, I, I, so I've. Go ahead, go ahead. I've. I've taught astrophysics a bit back in the day. And so what we see, maybe the same number of atoms, but they aren't in the same formation. No, no. And, and, not and they're, at all. They are evolving into higher levels yeah, of complexity. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, so there's really two questions here, and they go in very different directions. So one is where is that evolutionary process leading? But more importantly is if what you're saying is true, if all will be well, if if there is this ultimate hope and faith in the resurrection of all things in, in Christ or in however you want to put the theology, then why do my actions matter? Why, why should I pick up my cross and follow Christ? Because it's hard work. And if my actions, if the end result is given, then why bother? Let me say something I don't mean to offend you, but the main people who offer that argument are people who were raised Christian. I used to have in Cincinnati when I lived there a whole bunch of Jewish friends. And uh, I remember asking them, and they were some of the most engaged people Mm -hmm. in the politics of Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Not the Catholics, but the Jews, Mm -hmm. right? And they told me, you do it to be a mensch. This is what it means in your one crack at life to do it well. It's like the Buddhists say, goodness is its own reward, evil is its own punishment. You and I got so trained in we do good things for the sake of reward or to avoid punishment. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask a more difficult question. To To the listener out there who is lying on their living room floor in a fit of depression and con- contemplating suicide, why should they get up off that floor, pick up their cross, and try to make a difference in the world? Why shouldn't we, for the, the cynic for or the depressive or the person who doesn't have that faith, why, why not just bring on the hookers and the heroin and live it up large until you die and not give a care about the end product of the world? Why, why in a time of global crisis should we be engaged if the end result is inevitable? Because if failure is not an option, then why do my actions have meaning? Try to let go of the word should. Uh, if we could think outside of shoulds and oughts, mm-hmm. it helps a lot. Uh, why would I want to? Okay, you always know how to get around me. Uh, why would I want to? Why? Why would I? So, so, mm, yeah. so the problem with heroin, for example, is not that it's it's unpleasant. It's extraordinarily pleasurable, right? It's the comeback. It's coming I back. Wouldn't know. I wouldn't either, but but <laughs> certainly I've had my own experiences uh, yeah, with opioids, sure, sure. Um, prescriptions and whatnot. So if they're they're very pleasurable, and the only problem with them is coming back. To normalcy and to civilization and to a, a, res- 
a responsible life. If you don't mm-hmm. want to come back from the, the hole and the horror and the pit that opioids or drugs will put you into, if it's a one-way trip, it's a very pleasant one. Mm-hmm. It's the back out that's the hard part. So someone who's in that pit, why come back out? Or why not just follow it all the way down and, and, and exit in a, in a blaze of, 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 of medicated, stupid, and, and of pleasure, right, essentially? People uh, who have asked the most of themselves have followed, I know this sounds pretty pretty, an inner voice that we call the indwelling Holy Spirit that asks more of you, that asks all of you, that asks the best of you, not that any of us do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And when you learn to trust that voice, you will want to give back. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. To not listen to that voice is to be in hell Mm -hmm. or to create hell for other people. And I think the, the greatest way we've done a disservice in the preaching of the gospel is not telling people that this this objective presence within you is objective. Mm-hmm. It's nothing you earn by being baptized or obeying the Ten Commandments. You have, now here's the word we usually use, you have a soul. Mm-hmm. And your soul is like the seed of you. When, you. when you're trained to listen to your soul, you will want to make a difference. You'll want to serve. You'll want to love. No, I don't mean heroic ways. You just don't want to hate. I, but ha- I, believe me, there's people I want to hate, yeah. but I, I just can't do it anymore. I can't. There's a voice that doesn't let me. Well, let me I don't co- even wonder where it comes from well, sometimes. Let me, let me come at the same question from a completely different angle. All right. All right. So You've got too many angles. No, they're brilliant. Go ahead. So I'm going to go back to Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov oh, for wow, a minute. Oh, that's a good one. And there's the famous character in the book by the name of Father Zosima, Father. right, who's one of the great literary um, – Heroes, shall we say, yes, of, yes. of uh, certainly of religious life and of all yes, yes. philosophical yes. thinking, and the Brothers Karamazov, of course, is this great spiritual classic. And one of the crowning, I'm going to read to you a, a brief paragraph from Father Zosima's speech, which is one of his most famous. This is the closing sentences of one of his most famous speeches when he's talking to the brothers as they're about to leave the monastery and go out into the world. And particularly he's talking to Aloysia, right, and who is the, 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 the hero of the book. And Father Zuzima says this. He says, For no, dear ones, that every one of us is undoubtedly responsible for all humanity and everything on earth, not merely through the general sinfulness of creation, but each one personally for all humankind and for every individual. This knowledge is the crown of life for the monk and for every person. For monks are not special, but only what all people ought to be. Now, now, do you agree with that passage? And if so, does universal Christ also imply universal responsibility for all humanity and everything on earth? And can you, can you tie those two ideas together or no? Yes, I love it, every, every word of it. You know, what your soul calls you to, even more than service and helping people, that has too many ego payoffs. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. The deeper call is solidarity. Mm-hmm. Solidarity. That you, your soul is united to every other soul. And there's one, consciousness is one. It's shared. Mm-hmm. It's not a secretion of the private brain. Mm-hmm. You don't gain consciousness by going to school. Mm-hmm. In fact, often you lose it mm-hmm. if it's too logical, your school. But um, you, you fall into consciousness. Mm-hmm. When your ego is out of the way, when your power needs aren't dominating your whole life, and that's what he's talking about. An act of solidarity, and that's what I see on on the cross. Mm -hmm. Jesus is in absolute solidarity, symbolically. But it had to be a symbol that we would catch or get 
with every act of blood that has been he- shed since Cain until today. But why is it symbolic and not literal if Christ is in everything? No, the, the extended body of Christ, it is literal, mm-hmm. yeah. But we need to get a archetypal mm-hmm. symbol that we can look at. Okay. So Jesus is the archetype of the whole. Mm -hmm. He's the shortcut like you have on your computer. If you want to see what's happening, the map of the whole in one concise Mm -hmm. image, you can't do much better than the death and resurrection of Jesus, really. And that doesn't mean you join the Christian religion. Right. (laughs) Okay, so let me me circle back to this question of the inevitability of the outcome of the universe. If it all will be well— why should any of these kids be protesting today? Because they want to be in communion with the real. Eh, and, but couldn't they do that somewhere else? You're back to the shoulds and oughts. You don't have to. <laughs> the gospel calls are always an invitation. But here's my question. For, for, for the 18-year-old out there protesting right now because of climate change, because they're facing a future for themselves, mm-hmm. for their children, for their grandchildren that, that could be hell on earth in many ways. Yes. That climate change seems to be this issue that demands a collective and universal response. Mm-hmm. That if we aren't engaging mm-hmm. in our universal responsibility mm-hmm. individually, each of us, then we collectively can take ourselves to a almost literal hell on earth. So in order to prevent that catastrophe from the the systemic effects of climate change, it's going to require active participation, in my opinion, of all of us. Solidarity. 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 And and instead of being a should or a must or an ought, it becomes, when does it become an, again, going back to the idea, if the end result is inevitably going to turn out well, where does the end? urgency come for someone even in the civil it rights comes movement from that in inner seed <laughs> that inner motivation the, the two different journeys are being correct and being connected i'm talking about being connected mm-hmm. and that's what the spirit enlivens in your soul whereas if you were raised in the kind of catholicism i was it was about being richard privately being correct mm-hmm. And that's nothing but shoulds and oughts. Mm-hmm. And, and their shoulds and oughts aren't bad, but they don't really create happy people or, or people who care about their neighbor, mm-hmm. to be perfectly honest. Uh, it's, you know, how can I, apart from you, go to heaven? Mm-hmm. Uh, that just isn't going to work. It never wa- did work. So think of being connected instead of correct. Mm-hmm. Think of being aligned instead of absolute. Mm-hmm. I'm just searching for, uh, you know, the right words. But the religion, when it's in the, the first model of being absolute or think it's, it has the absolute, creates zealots, not really lovers. Mm-hmm. Really, and you've met them, and I've oh, met yeah. them. Oh, yeah, Sure. It's just, I mean, I've been a priest 50 years next year. <laughs> and, uh, oh, my God. I mean, I, sometimes the people I want to be around the least, I mm. hate to admit it, are religious people. Because of this. Because zeal- this correct thing. Mm-hmm. You know, this zealotry for usually one cause about which they could be totally right. Mm-hmm. I had mass this Wednesday in Albuquerque, and all their humble little Mexican Americans come up. I love most of them. I think they love me. There was a new lady who appeared, and she got to the front and stopped the line, fell to her feet, made the sign of the cross, threw out her hands, and <laughs> opened her mouth. <laughs> it's <was>, okay. <laughs> there was just so much of self there. Yes. It was, that self is on display. Right, it has not died. And we do you see it also in the 
in the monastic habit and in the priestly yeah, collar. And, and I the, wear my Franciscan yeah. robe. I love to. Yeah. But not all the time. Yeah. Well, I remember the first time I put on the Benedictine habit, I went and pranced in front of the mirror for a good 45 <laughs> minutes. I was like, look at me, look at me, right? Oh, look at me. <laughs> and then the next day when you discover you're naked underneath your habit, just like everybody else. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so let me so – I'm still not – You're asking such good questions. Because it's – Keep going. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to respectfully disagree with you on this because I, I'm you're still free. not convinced that the outcome is certain. Because I, it seems... Oh, no, there's a gap there, only filled by grace and faith. All right, so that isn't our search, right. is for certitude. But, our, our hope is for hope. Okay, fair, right. Yeah, so we, yeah. we have hope in the future. We have faith in, in God's love. And that God's love. faithfulness mm-hmm. fills in all the gaps, all of them. Hmm. That's when, then, what infinite love means. So is it, is it more like Christ on the cross saying, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? That You've got to go through that. In that moment. It, yes. But then on the other side of it, there's something that you couldn't have predicted. Father, into your hands, I, I commend, commend my spirit. spirit. And it, Being his last line. Yeah. yeah. So um, is that a metaphor that we might look at for all these social issues that are, are plaguing us right now? Yeah. That it, are we? Is it sort of a... a gl- First of all, I, I don't want to be so pessimistic about the present you're not, because you're not. I think there's so many wonderful things happening yes, in the world, yes. and we've certainly, if you were to compare a snapshot of human experience today and compare it to a hundred years ago That's or right. a thousand years ago, That's right. the suffering back then was yeah, far violence more, right. back then and, much more and death, yeah. disease, you know, medicines, mm-hmm. all these things, and rule of law and civilization. But but it seems like it feels from Everyone, I, I, my, I'm speaking, speaking for myself and, and and people I talk to that there's this kind of collective crucifixion that's happening in our culture right now. Yeah. There's this this just tremendous suffering, yeah. and it's coming out on the left, on the right, in different ways. That's right. It's not one party, it's not one viewpoint, but everyone seems to be struggling in in a in a deeply existential way in this sort of crucifixion. I don't I'm not really going anywhere with this, but more making an observation and and sort of wondering um are we in this moment of why why do the youth feel so forsaken? Why do we feel so mm-hmm. hopeless about this these issues climate change just being one of many, but it's a it's a flashpoint, right? Um and is it is it blind hope for the future? Is it optimistic? Is it naive? Or is it um, so? I, I just want to get this sense of sure. of. So I'm, I'm trying to. So here's here's my problem: is it feels like the answer you you're giving, almost. And I and I I'm not trying to no, be a hard ass on you. I'm just saying. Well, I am a little bit because I like you. Um, <laughs> but but you you you've got contemplation and action, and yeah. I and. And I like the action. I like the action part, right? Good. But obviously, I've had training in the contemplative part. Contemplative. So I'm I'm wondering, how do you bring the con- contemplation into action? How do we um, make the action as sacred and as important as the con- contemplation? Where if we're saying the end result is going to be all will be well and all shall be well, all manner of things will be well, then doesn't that take, doesn't that cut the legs out from underneath the action part? And I understand the solid, the solidarity, it's a nice phrase, but it doesn't quite work for me. And I don't know why. And maybe you mm. could help me tease it out. Why? Mm. Just seeing your solidarity with the universe and the, with, the, with your And world, with your brothers and sisters. I, I think the action comes out of that mystical experience if you have it. But, but the mystical experience is pretty far down the road and maybe too esoteric for most. If, it's a, if, a, if that spiral analogy you're mentioning, if we all start, certainly I did, and I have a long way to go, we all start at a pretty basic level. And so an 18-year-old probably isn't going to be able to have a mystical experience yet. Um, and if they do, great. But it certainly takes a certain... Like Socrates said, one can't philosophize until one is past 50, say. Is that all right? Um, in part, and I'm not there yet. I'm getting close to 50, but... 
the the problem being is you don't have enough experience behind it. Yes, your ego is still is. not fully formed. You can't let go of your ego until it's a fully formed ego. That's right. If you're 18, well, you're, partially formed, right? Or yeah, at least yeah. solid enough that you, you right. there's a developmental stage that yeah. you, the ego has to be strong enough right. to be willfully released. That's and right. if you're young, the the ego is still in formation, and so it's probably not appropriate yet to be letting it go on that depth of, of a level of experience. Um, maybe not even possible. I, I certainly wouldn't have been for me. Uh, and so, so that's, a, that's a bit of a sidebar, but my point being is that what do you say to that 18-year-old marching today that really gives them that hope that things can be so much better, but without the certitude that comes that leads to a, a, a complacency, a, a, a passivity that so many people are maybe listening to the show and people who are not engaging with the problems of the world, mm. the sort of the, the, the non-engaged Buddhism or the non-engaged Christian, mm. can you be a Buddhist or a Christian or a person of deep faith and not engage with the world? And so that's my, my struggle. It's a, per, it's a real, it's a real oh, question. It's real for most people. Love, which is... God, which is grace, which is the soul, they're all the same thing, urges you to care instead of not to care. Um, that would be my best attempt at an answer right now. Love always moves toward union, mm -hmm. not disunion. And I'm calling that union solidarity with others toward a kind of caring, a universal caring. Mm -hmm. um, now, it takes much of your life to grow. Carol Gilligan, the developmental psychologist, says you, you start with some degree of self-care, you move to family care of people like you mm -hmm. and people of your ethnicity and your religion. Most people stop there. But some move to universal care. Mm -hmm. That it doesn't matter if they're American or Catholic, or it might be easier for you to talk to them if you were raised that way. But uh, you don't prefer them over anybody else who's suffering. So it's an outward moving spiral. So it's just a, an option for care mm -hmm. that comes from the nature of the soul. Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit, he said, the physical structure of the universe is love. Mm. That everything is attracted to everything. I think I quote that somewhere in the mm -hmm. book. Everything's attracted to everything. And this creates all the orbits and cycles and mm -hmm. everything, the, key, the force fields, and we can't even figure them out. But if love is the physical structure of the universe. Then when you plug into that love, you've plugged into consciousness, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, but I can't prove that to anybody. You know what, I'm gonna come back where we talked by participation. Mm -hmm. When you dive into that love, you know, feel, understand, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. This, it isn't rational reason, but it's very reasonable. It, it creates, and I'll just settle for a psychological conclusion, it creates happy people and healthy people mm. who, who opt for love instead of opting for separation and anger and selfishness. Mm. Uh, and I've met so many of them all around the world. Mm. They're happy and healthy. I don't mean physically healthy. Mm -hmm. They might be that too. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they aren't. Oftentimes their bodies are racked with pain, but they're emotionally healthy. Well, then so you're talking about the big scale structure, the structure of the universe being love. So let me ask yes. you sort of two questions on that front. And the first is maybe um, sort of a hard question, but, or maybe not. If, if, God's incarn if God incarnates into matter, right, yes. in the Big Bang, and you said in Universal Christ that that's the first Bible, the first story. Nature is the first, first story. Bible. And we know at the beginning of time, there was just, the universe started with just quantum foam, and then that 
cools into hydrogen. I've never heard the word foam before. Really? Is that what they say in school now? It's it's one of the quantum quantum foam. foam. It's this. That's good. It's this frothy. Well, all metaphors limp, and that's a good one. And and in truth, our 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 physics can't even describe. No. At at a certain point, we don't have the language for it or the science for it. But we do know it. It quickly cools this ball of energy that comes in. Let there be light, and essentially, we have this big outpouring of energy into the universe. It takes its shape as quantum foam at f- in the first microseconds of the yes. universe, and then within a f- fraction of a second, it cools into hydrogen gas okay. and maybe a little bit of helium. And then we get um, – that then coalesces into big balls, which are called stars, and they ignite, and stellar nuclear chemistry forges all the higher, heavier elements of our of our universe. Those stars explode – sort of belch out into the universe heavy elements. Now we get new planets or new stars with with planets around them. And a long, long evolutionary process occurs until we get to you and I sitting here in front of a microphone uh, having a conversation. Consciousness evolves into the, or springs forth into the universe. So we see this evolution. It, I think this is just me going off a little bit, but evolution isn't just Darwin biology, evolution seems to be baked into the whole cell stru- structure of the universe. And if that's true, um, is God learning through that process? What is God gaining through the evolutionary process? And, and why bother with the whole evolutionary process? Oh, I love this kind of stuff, but I'll never do justice to it. Most Christianity, which thinks it's so orthodox, is not Trinitarian. Its notion of God is a monarch, a sole monarch, sitting on a throne, male, throwing thunderbolts down. Zeus, Mm -hmm. Deus in Latin. Uh, Whereas the Christian shape of God was supposed to be Trinitarian. Mm -hmm. God as relationship itself. Now once God is relationship, When you enter into a relationship, I'm sure you've had many girlfriends, they change you. In fact, you don't have a relationship unless you give them the power to change you. And a lot of men don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not letting you touch my insides. Mm -hmm. Uh, To have an authentic relationship, our word for that is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. We let the other have power to change us. Well, let's apply that to the divine realm. Mm. If God is in honest, real relationship, then your existence on this planet for 36 years? 46 years. 46, sorry. (laughs) Thank you. It's a compliment. God, you don't look that old. Uh, Then once God agreed to enter into a relationship with you, Mm God changed Mm. because you're an absolutely new creation. There's never been another Doug like you, you see? Mm -hmm. Now, that's very Franciscan Mm -hmm. spirituality. So so God is changing in this level. It's called process theology. Mm -hmm. If you want to look up some heavy books on it, (laughs) that's not my idea. Go ahead, well, isn't that a little bit con- uh, paradox? I mean, well, yeah, everything please. is paradoxical at some point, everything. right? But, uh, but, but in, big things no, right. are paradoxical. No. But isn't that the paradox to put a finger on it? If, as you say in Universal, Universal Christ, if God is infinite love, right? Is that fair? Infinite, infinite, which we can't imagine. But then, how can that love be growing and be infinite? If 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 I'm changing God. Right? Isn't God's love growing? And if God's love is growing, it uh, as well. Let me put it this way: If uh, here's another way at, at the question, maybe leave God aside because I don't know what God's doing, mm-hmm. but I know what I'm doing, mm-hmm. and hopefully, what I'm doing in my life is growing in the capacity for love. And if Very the good. and if good. if I'm an if I am God incarnate, as you are God incarnate, as Javier is God incarnate, right? We all are, are an incarnation of of, the, of the Christ, right? And, and I'm growing in love, is God also growing in love? Yes. And so how are you adding love to the infinite love? <clears throat> Sometimes I've started sermons 
and people don't know where I'm going with it, but I say, uh, what is one half of infinite? And there's silence. Of course, mm -hmm. Catholics aren't used to answering. Mm -hmm. If you say it to black people, they'll all <laughs> start shouting out. Uh, and I'll say, come on, come on, what's one half of infinite? And some will say, infinite. Mm -hmm. That's right. What's infinite times two? It's mm -hmm. infinite. Right. So here's where the mind has to give up and break down. It's, it's um, one way I've said it many times over the years, when you get the gospel, you, uh, you can't get it mm -hmm. unless you stop counting, stop weighing, stop measuring. You've got to move from the world of retributive justice where all of us live our lives. Well, maybe maybe here's a here's a way forward, and this is going back to Plato a little bit. Um, it's sort of a, similar to your question of what's half of infinite. Well, how many points are there on a line? So a line in mathematics and geometry goes out oh, to God, infinity. You're going to leave me in the dust. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so so if a line has an infinite number of points on points. it, right? Now, if and it's a one-dimensional object. Yes. Now, if we expand that into two dimensions, we get a geometric plane. How many points are there on a geometric plane, which is in two dimensions? Infinite. If we move it into three dimensions, into space, how many points are there in all of space? Infinite. But they're higher orders of infinity. Oh, well, I bet we could work with that. Right. So that there is yeah. the infinite love of God, but there's a capacity to add to it on some level mm -hmm. to a higher order of, of, inf of an infinite set. Yeah. Uh, it's, so you're, you're, you're still... It's again the brain is freezing up here, but infinity contained in different capacity mm -hmm. containers. Mm -hmm. So say Bonaventure, our Franciscan mystic, he said a stone uh, contains the naked existence of being, mm -hmm. but it's still being. Mm -hmm. you know? An animal contains the sentient mm -hmm. nature of being. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, a plant, the living nature of being. Mm -hmm. Those are, just as you were saying, different levels. Mm -hmm. But uh, we differed from Thomas Aquinas, by the way. We didn't <laughs> study him in Franciscan <laughs> seminary. We studied a man that you've hardly heard of, John Dun Scotus. Mm -hmm. And he said, we don't believe in the analogy of being. I don't know if you remember that term, mm -hmm. that we can know human beings and animals in an analogous way to God, mm -hmm. by analogy. Don Scotus took it further. <laughs> he said, no, we believe in the univocity of being. Univocity means one voice. Mm -hmm. You may speak with one voice of the being of water and plants and animals and humans and angels and God. Mm. Now, where did he get the courage to talk that way? From the simple vision of St. Francis. It's so nice to talk about this in the city of St. Francis, uh, who called everything brother and sister, yeah. even the elements, sister fire, brother air. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pantheism. Mm -hmm. We're back where we started our talk this mm -hmm. afternoon. Mm -hmm. well, how dare you call air and water and and foxes and ducks, brother and sister. That's the univocity of being. Once you touch upon being, any naked being is enough to convert you. Teresa of Avila said that. Mm -hmm. She says, even a sardine can convert <laughs> you. <laughs> well, 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 once you see the gratuity, uh -huh. the non-necessity, the beauty, yeah of that sardine. Why should there be a sardine <laughs> instead of no sardines, you know? <laughs> what a brilliant. Yeah. But see, that's a mystical knowing. It is. People who just add mm -hmm. numbers and mm -hmm. for and subtract for their sinfulness, yeah. they never get there. Yeah. So is it fair to say if you go deeply into the into any one thing, you hit the ground of all being? That's right. Okay. That's right. right. It's all a matter. There's one chapter on e that in e the book. E even money? Okay. <laughs> you know, I say it about sin, not in this book, uh -huh. but in some even that's the miracle of for me of the gospel is that 
God even uses sin to mm-hmm. bring you to God. Mm-hmm. The, sin is not a dead end. Mm-hmm. In fact, most of the great sinners well, were, let me, let uh, me. were saints, were sinners. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Go ahead. But you, now, but you bring up the word sin in connection to money. Is that your Franciscan uh, bias a little bit? Oh, no, I wasn't trying to make that connection. Okay. I promise I wasn't. No. Uh, yeah, money... Because it seems like if you go deeply into money, you touch the whole world. Here, here's the way of saying it. If you stay on the surface of anything, mm-hmm. you can do bad. If you go to the depth of the meaning of anything, mm-hmm. including sin and including money, mm-hmm. you can do very good things with it. Okay. It's the surface that kills you. Mm-hmm. And that's why I've said for many years, the, the capital sin of the United States of America is superficiality. Uh, We're just going to be entertained to death. Yep. And raising up people who live on the surface, bread circuses, mm-hmm. as the Romans were called, you know. It's just how much entertainment do we need? Yeah. How loud can the speakers get? <laughs> Oh, it's right. just, it's not working. Okay, well, let me go back to that question then. Right. Let's go back to the structure of the universe. And you said, well, here's a question for you. This is one of my big questions. So if DNA, right, is the hardware of the human existence, right, could stories be the software? And perhaps we can't survive without a story to live by because maybe that's yeah. what we use yeah. to make sense of the world. To configure our mind, you need stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, You need narratives mm-hmm. is the new word, mm-hmm. and it's a good word. You need a narrative to fit your – that's why I've met PhDs mm-hmm. in medicine who still live out of their little Catholic – stories that they learned in the first grade Mm -hmm. because they're so healing they're so good they're so true you can't beat them you really can't and whatever's going to hold the psyche together we're going to keep believing Mm -hmm. you know well then let me ask you this question if that's true what update or reboot are you trying to make to the story of christianity or the story of the world through the universal christ I'm trying to give it permission, as if it needs it from me, but to uh, honor the prayer of Jesus at the Last Supper, that all may be one. He prayed for unity. Mm -hmm. And our present narrative creates tribes, not union. It creates exclusion, not inclusion. Mm -hmm. It creates violence, not nonviolence. But remember, we're only 21 years old. (laughs) God must be so patient. God must be so humble to just, okay, that's where the boys are at now. But I'm going to love them anyway. And some of our saints said, the moment the veil parts and you see the infinite love, no soul will be able to resist it. Mm. Infinite love. I, I guess I believe that. Hmm. And no one can resist infinite love. Hmm. Well, then let me ask you a a follow-up question to that. So if that infinite love, um, if we're supposed to embody that love and... and None of us can, though. Okay. Because we're finite. But go ahead. But to the extent that we're able... I keep slipping down in this (laughs) chair. (laughs) It isn't the most comfortable of chairs. It's probably my body shape. (laughs) Sorry, we can can swap it out if you like. No, no, no. All right. So should we love others unconditionally, or are there conditions that are so abusive that we have both the right wow, there you go. and duty to revoke or, re- or renegotiate mm-hmm. our love and commitments to others? And so maybe where does the spiritual obligation to be more loving, forgiving, and compassionate end, and the duty to tell someone off begin? Loving is not the same as liking. Mm. And your, your tickers go off. And this is not likable. This is not good. Mm-hmm. This is not liberating. Mm-hmm. This is not life-giving. You know? Now, you still honor. Uh, well, let's make that distinction. 
Je, excuse me, Genesis 1, 26, 27 says, Let us create, plural pronoun, the Trinitarian God, in our image and likeness. Mm -hmm. Image is the objective mark, soul, presence that every creature carries. If one God created all things, everything carries the divine DNA. Mm -hmm. Likeness, and this was studied in Catholic theology for centuries. What's the difference between image and likeness? Mm. Image is objective presence. You may not argue about it. You may not say black people don't have it, although we sure tried. Mm -hmm. You may not say Native Americans don't have it, although we sure tried. You can't wiggle on that. Uh, it was supposed to overcome the gospel. Racism, sexism, homophobia, classism. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to create a society of, of loving people. Likeness is just being honest. That we all have the same image dwelling within us. All of us have appropriated that image to a different degree. Mm. Subjectively, let's just put it this way. Some people are more like Jesus than others. <laughs> if Jesus is the archetype, you know, we all know it. So, but God loves the image of God in you mm -hmm. and forgives the likeness. Hmm. Can you give us a little, can we dial it a little more tighter, though? All right. I mean, because that's a, that's a high... That's terrible. Go ahead. That, that's a high-level philosophy <laughs> and a lot of semantics for someone who's struggling you know, uh, out in the world right now in relationship, yes. in a marriage, who's maybe yes. thinking of getting a divorce, someone who's dealing with um, an abusive spouse sure. or um, an, a brother or sister who may be um, going off on an alcoholic rage. Uh, wh when do you, and, and again, it, there's obviously no simple answer to this, but it's just a hard question that I'm, I, I wrestle with. And i was wondering if you can just help help us right. clarify the problem. That's a good one is when do you basically tell someone to go to hell? Wow. When is compassion and become enablement? Yes. When does kindness and love become codependence? How do it's you just wonderful that we created, I'm glad you used that word, the word codependence. Mm -hmm. Cuz a lot that was called love was codependence. Mm -hmm. Mutual neediness mm -hmm. sucking off of one another, mm -hmm. forgive me. Sure. It, <laughs> and uh, it's just it, it doesn't enrich either party. Mm -hmm. They both remain immature. Mm -hmm. And this is where psychology is so good and where a 21-year-old needs good psychology. Much of psycho good psychology is boundary keeping, mm -hmm. creating a, a healthy ego that has boundaries, and you don't let other people tear them away from you. You know, now that might look like hardness, tough love. Mm -hmm. It probably will. And you'll go through guilt and doubt. Well, I wasn't a being a very loving Christian. Mm -hmm. But when I see the amount, and I've experienced the amount of manipulative, manipulative people in our culture, and it gets even worse the more known you are, <laughs> if I can say that. God, the amount of people who try to use me. And I'm nothing. I'm, you know, small potatoes. As you know, Bono is a friend of mine. You should hear his story. Oh, really? But you know, <laughs> it's just the, the more power and money and fame you have, mm -hmm. the more people want to manipulate you. Mm -hmm. And you, the trouble is you start mistrusting all love. Mm. And you tend to lessen the circle of people you can trust. It's very sad. And that can lead you to do a very – into. A, a hell on a, a, con a, a kind of conscious yeah. kind of hell. Hell other people, people. Yeah. 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 So you, you've, if you don't have a spiritual discipline to keep your heart open in hell, uh, I think we know why so many actors and rock uh, musicians turn to drugs. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to keep the heart space open with all the people who've betrayed them. Mm. and talked about them and used them and loved them just for their money mm -hmm. or their fame. Well, that's I always sort of strikes me when I, you know, I, I've met a few of those people in my time, not at your level by any means, but it's um, 
helpful for me just to I mean, I feel so sad for some of them, and know, and and then and then you talk. They never look happy. They never, and then you talk to people. Oh, you met so and so. You met so and so, and and they and they think that their lifestyle is, yes. and and they're even, um, and I see this among on the left quite a bit. Is this anger, resentment, or even hatred of people who are wealthy and or famous or have all this power and celebrity? And it's like, you know, they're in. Did did you think the Buddha was wrong? Right? Mm. Is the so the Buddha, as you know very well, said that life is suffering. And did you think that Bono was the exception? Mm. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, a, it's a different cross. You know, you might, you might be flying. And that's really true. And yeah. I know that by knowing you two personally, you yeah. know. They are all four of them carrying crosses. Yeah. So, so I think the joke I made with you last weekend was, uh, you know, we may be you, you may be you may be flying first class, but the destination is no, still go- Franciscans. The destination we aren't allowed is allowed to fly first class. But if you're flying first class like Bono, <laughs> the destination is still Golgotha, right? Yeah. 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 It's so true. We're all going to. We're all. We all have a cross. We're all yes. Right. Everybody is carrying a deep and secret wound. Mm-hmm. I mean that. Everybody. Okay, so what's yours? Oh, my God. What's, <laughs> that I've been put on this pedestal now since early 70s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know it's not true. Mm-hmm. I know I'm naked underneath my clothes like everybody else. I know uh, I fear that I'm a phony mm-hmm. every other day. Mm-hmm. And I say, where do these words come from? Even these words I'm saying to you right now. Yeah. I didn't think about this till you asked me. Uh, so it makes me think I'm making them up. Maybe I am. I don't know. But isn't that isn't <laughs> isn't that isn't all philosophy made up? I mean, in the sense of all ideas, every every discovery, every in, intuition, it's all. I don't mean made up in a in a, in a glib way. I mean, yeah, it, but yeah. but it came out of your creativity out of your and your per- experience. And, yeah. and you may be, and I, just from observing you, you seem to be someone whose creativity is most. Um, we, what we call nowadays the, the buzzword is called flow state. Like when do yeah. you when do you get into I that? Was f- used in uh, that this uh, all right. So yeah. so you seem to hit your flow state in conversation with another person on the spot like that's yeah. your that's those are the true. those seem to be some of the key some of the key ingredients that's maybe true. there are others for you to get into that flow state where you can creatively think about ideas mm-hmm. um and also with through your writing in the and in, in being in, in solitude in, in your hermitage yeah. you obviously have some wonderful things come out of that so so i'm trying to maybe give you who am i to give you permission no but, you give me but but oh, why, yeah. why put that down so you're you're making it up on that's the spot it. so what why put it down? You know, uh, Anthony DeMello, the Jesuit from mm-hmm. India, he was before your time, mm-hmm. probably. He said, eventually you say, I'm an ass, you're an ass, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And now we're free. Mm-hmm. We, mm-hmm. we can stop all this pretending and this proving. I mean, for me, it, it's, I know, no. I became a priest for the wrong reason. I became celibate for the wrong reason. <laughs> so I can't stand on some kind of mm-hmm. pedestal of purity. Yeah. My motivation for both of those has changed 35 times mm-hmm. in my moving to, to 76. But could it be otherwise? I don't think so. Yeah. I think the journey uh, is largely a matter of the gradual purification of motive Mm -hmm. why do i do what i do because what does any 22 year old know i know i mean i know but i wonder why god took this risk i mean every young man Mm. who gets married at 22 Mm. it's not love it's lust yeah but he can't know that yet (laughs) 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 he can't yeah I don't know why God allows such stupidity to it, and, and yet it's amazing or, how many make it work. Or you know? take the vow of celibacy, or yes, join the priesthood, yes. or and it, exactly. but but you have to take you have to still have to act anyway, even even with imperfect information. You have you, That's well, right. well economi- That's right. economists would call it asymmetry of information. You, you don't Ooh, have like yeah. enough information to yeah. make a decision. So whatever you make is probably going to be a bad one, but you got to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how life is. That's lovely. And it's amazing just so I'm not making people scared. It's amazing how much lust turns into love. Yeah. 
It really is. I mean, I have counseled so many sweet old couples mm -hmm. who just love one another. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so let me jump into some other questions here. I'm sort of, uh, we, and, and we go as long as you like. If you get tired, you you just shut me up. Hold on, real quick. Mm -hmm. We've we're running out of the battery space, okay. and we've got a, a stop at five. Okay. So if that's okay, because yeah, that's we've got enough. a show that's coming in. Okay. So we'll we'll edit this part out. Mm -hmm. But if you can work into the last part of the okay. the no. question, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah. Um, gosh, I sorry about that. I know it moved really fast. I've got so uh, many more questions. Um, you can ask them over dinner. Too. All right. Well, you don't have to record them. Um, <laughs> You're just so spiritually curious. It's beautiful. Go ahead. All right. So I'm going to close with an idea. Just we won't even begin to tap all of it, but I wanted to just play with it a little bit and and to get your reaction to something that's been on my mind, which is the idea of universal Christ being sort of a foundational one piece of, of a different kind of trinity, of perhaps okay. universal Christ, which is a sort of a might move into, if, if Christ is manifesting and incarnating in me, then doesn't the responsibility of Christ a universal responsibility also reside mm. in me for the whole world. And does that sort of the opposite of what on Ron would call Atlas shrugged, but more of an, uh, the Atlas embraced or shouldered, which then might lead to universal crucifixion or universal suffering is, is sort of the part of why there's so much suffering in the world that those three pieces, universal Christ, universal suffering or universal crucif crucifixion, and universal responsibility might be another way of framing um, a, a model moving forward philosophically to understand how we might operate in the world. If I understand you, Doug, uh, that's why most religion has morphed, probably rightly so, into ethics, mm -hmm. into morality, mm -hmm. saying if you know this wonderful unitive mm -hmm. state of love, then this has carries an obligation mm -hmm. to pass it on, or as we say today, to, to give back. I think that's true. Oh, it's obviously true. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we create a very narcissistic form of religion if we don't do that. Mm -hmm. Even the 12-step program gets to step 12, mm -hmm. give it back help other alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the major failures of most of mainline Christianity that the vast majority, in my opinion, I hope I'm wrong, of Christians don't do a lot of volunteer work. Mm -hmm. don't, really, they don't do a lot of service work. I have the parish mass in well, I won't say the parish here on radio, but it's, oh, I love them, and they love me, as mm -hmm. I told you before. But these dear people who come at 7 o'clock Mass every morning, I don't see them the rest of the week mm. in cleaning up the grounds <laughs> or when the immigrants came through town and we tried to help them. It wasn't the prayer people. Mm -hmm. you know? So we have not communicated that divine union that doesn't lead to divine service is an incomplete job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not condemning anybody. They didn't get the full message. Mm -hmm. They were told their job was to go to Mass. They're official <laughs> prayers. <laughs> and they come in and they greet one another the way Mexican-Americans do it. They have to greet everybody in the church. It's the same 30 people, mm -hmm. you know. But what disappoints me is the lack of uh, commun connection mm -hmm. between those 30 people and the work of the parish. Yeah. There's the doers and there's the prayers. Mm -hmm. That's why I named the center. The Center for Action and Contemplation. We got to put those two together. Yeah. yeah. Well, you do it so so brilliantly, and we are out of time. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I wish we could hang out here and chat all evening, and maybe you'll grace us again one of these days, and we can oh, ask you some more impossible questions. One hour up the road with a free ride. <laughs> Why not? Thank you, Doug. Thank You're, you, Richard. Appreciate it's it. It's beautiful to meet people with true and mature spiritual curiosity. Thank you. Thank you.